Apple is the company you either love or love to hate. It's amassed an army of loyal fanboys that are extremely eager to purchase their newest phones and computers. The only thing Apple loyalists like more than the product themselves is buying them and telling everyone about it. But what if there was a way for Apple to charge you for buying products that they don't even make? Enter the Apple credit card. T-O-T-S. Throw out the scripts. The Apple credit card has been a multi-billion dollar failure, but not for Apple. Surprisingly, they aren't on the hook for this. The one left holding the bag is actually their banking partner, Goldman Sachs. They have tarnished both their own reputation and Apple's with this credit card. You might know Goldman Sachs as the investment bank from their contributing role to the 2008 housing crash, or as the bank that's exclusive to the ultra-rich. After changing CEOs in 2018, Goldman Sachs is now led by David Solomon, part banker, part professional DJ. No, seriously, he is DJ D. Soul. Part of David's primary responsibilities, besides spinning records in the Hamptons, was to remove the exclusivity of banking with Goldman, to open their doors to the public. Their consumer bank, called Marcus, became a priority for the CEO, but lately it's become apparent that Goldman and regular folks maybe just aren't right for each other. Under this branch of consumer-focused products, Goldman launched Platform Solutions, a fintech umbrella of services including the Apple credit card. You might be thinking, how did Goldman's new consumer bank win such a potentially lucrative business from Apple, the largest tech company in the world? Surely the big established consumer-focused banks such as JP Morgan Chase would be in a far better position to bid on this account. Well, it turns out in their desperation to enter the consumer banking space, Goldman Sachs agreed to terms that were incredibly one-sided in Apple's favor. This was after all the other major banks had already passed on it first. The Apple credit card has the slogan, created by Apple, not a bank. Hmm. Goldman Sachs' $300 million investment developing the credit card says otherwise. To imply that Apple created the card on their own is hilariously incorrect. Apple really didn't create much besides a sleek piece of titanium that gives off the illusion of wealth. At least it's consistent with the Apple brand. The appeal of an Apple product has always been its minimalist design, high quality parts, and ease of use. However, in the world of finance, this isn't enough to be a market leader. The Apple credit card itself really doesn't provide any meaningful benefits, especially in comparison to its competitors. Besides some neat security features and its simplicity, the card is somewhat lackluster. Its flat 2% cashback is nice, but you could find better based on your spending habits. It does have one big attraction besides showing off the Apple logo, the fact that it's made from metal. Nice. Credit cards made from metal, opposed to the traditional plastic, have often been a telltale sign of wealth and douchebaggery. That's the sound of my maid telling me that brunch is ready. Hors d'oeuvres, please. Typically, to be eligible for a card made from metal, you must meet certain high income and spending requirements, the most notable being the Amex Centurion, known as the Black Card. Now, Apple offers the ability to appear rich for no fees and practically zero income requirements. What could go wrong? Turns out a lot. Remember that one-sided deal that Goldman Sachs agreed to in order to get the Apple credit card business? Well, now they have to face the consequences. Goldman agreed to approve as many iPhone users as possible, despite many having less than favorable credit scores. To qualify for this card, Goldman suggests that applicants need only a 660 credit score. That's what's considered fair, but it's not a good credit score either. However, in their filings, it's been discovered that more than a quarter of Goldman's card loans have gone to people with FICO scores below 660. That's not good. The card offers no annual fees, foreign transaction fees, or late payment fees, which is great for Apple and its customers, but for Goldman, they have to take on all the risk and get no reward. Who else feels this product is stupid? The card also uniquely offers 3% cash back on all Apple products, although arguably this encourages its cardholders to purchase more overpriced Apple products just to get the cash back. When this is combined with a mediocre credit score, it's unlikely the cardholder can properly afford it and therefore relies on credit to finance the purchase. With current poor economic conditions, it should be a surprise to nobody that many defaulted on their credit card bills. They have a charge-off rate of 2.93%, 
which is double that of other big banks offering credit cards. A charge-off means that the lender or creditor has written the account off as a loss after six months of missing payment. So Goldman is writing off double the amount of losses that their competitors do, but they receive virtually no benefit for taking on the additional risk. Wow, that makes, that makes no sense at all. I know. It's not only the defaulting that has caused the Apple credit card to be disastrous for the bank, but also an unexpected high amount of disputed transactions known as chargebacks. Chargebacks happen when a customer seeks a refund for a product or service billed on their card for any number of reasons. They've already set aside over a billion dollars in anticipated losses for this. Whoopsie daisy! <laughs> now Apple has just launched Pay Later, a service where users can split purchases into four payments with zero interest and no fees. They are now directly competing against the other Buy Now Pay Later companies such as Klarna, Affirm, and Afterpay. Unlike the credit card, however, Apple will be financially responsible for credit assessment and lending through a subsidiary called Apple Financing LLC. Goldman Sachs will still be involved in processing the back end, but they aren't on the hook for this. Our guess is that Goldman Sachs was probably offered to do the loans for the pay later service as well, but seeing the mounting losses for the Apple credit card declined the offer. Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice. Shame on me. Huh? Fool me. Shame on me. You. Fool me. Right. The... Got it. Take it or leave it. Okay. Apple has over $100 billion in cash, so why not cut out the middleman and do it themselves? Apple Pay Later will likely be far more successful than the credit card as they're competing in a far newer industry and have tighter controls over loan amounts. Having the Pay Later feature built in natively to your phone instead of through a third-party company such as Affirm will likely win over many new customers simply due to its ease of use. The Pay Later business doesn't even have to make money for Apple. They can just use it to get more people to justify buying Apple products who otherwise wouldn't. In a recent investor presentation, CEO David Solomon admitted defeat regarding the Apple credit card by stating that Goldman Sachs is considering strategic alternatives. Some have theorized that Goldman might shrink this consumer banking division and break their partnership with Apple. That means another bank would likely swoop in as partner for the Apple credit card. However, with this new launch of Apple Financing LLC, they might not need a partner. The real question is, can Apple run a consumer bank better than Goldman Sachs? We very well may be entering a new generation of banking, one dominated by tech companies instead of Wall Street.